My name is Sam Vaknin and I'm the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited. As far as the military is concerned, atrocities and massacres have their good sides. Such misdeeds and abuse serve important strategic goals. They boost the morale of the troops and let them blow off steam. They deter would-be insurgents. They teach the natives who is boss. The signal that atrocities and massacres send is that the soldiery will stop at nothing and will observe no law when it is out to subdue, to subdue a hostile population. This is why the perpetrators of such deeds, if they belong to a victorious army, are never punished properly and proportionately. Here's a story from Kosovo. Staff Sergeant Frank J. Rongi, sexually molested, forcibly sodomized in decent acts with the child, and then murdered an 11 years old girl in the basement of her drab building when her father went to market to do some shopping. Staff Sergeant Frank J. Rongi then spread flour from a United Nations aid package over the blood-stained floor. He wrapped the little, still warm body in two sacks and he dumped it under the staircase. He was sentenced to life in prison. It was a heinous crime which would have most certainly introduced him to the wrong end of a lethal injection in his homeland, the United States. So why the leniency? Staff Sergeant Rongi was wise to have unleashed his depravity in Kosovo upon an Albanian girl, and not, let's say, in Cleveland. Ceteris paribus, it would seem that the going rate for a dead Albanian girl is lower than from de for dead American ones. There is nothing new in this supercilious attitude of the new masters of the universe. Fiercely independent, solipsistically provincial, fatuously ignorant, the nation of video clips and sound bites has imposed its narcissistic so-called culture upon a world exhausted by wars, hot and cold. Never averse to exploiting the global institutions to its ends, the United States often refrains from providing them with means. It still owes in excess of 160 million US dollars to the poorer nations of the world its arrears to the United Nations peacekeeping operations. The United States refuses to subject itself to the judgments of the World Criminal Court, to the inspectors of the Chemical Weapons Convention, to the sanctions of the Anti-Landmines Treaty, and to the provisions of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. In short, the United States is a bully, making its own laws as it goes along, twisting arms and breaking bones when faced with opposition and ignoring the very edicts it promulgated at its convenience. Its soldiers and so-called peacekeepers, its bankers and businessmen, its traders and diplomats are its long arms, an embodiment of this potent mixture of superiority and contempt. The case, the case of the bestial murderer Rongi is not an aberration. It happened before, in Japan in 1995, for instance. Nor is the double moral standard applied only by the USA. When a most probably intoxicated Norwegian soldier killed a Macedonian minister and his family in a car crash in August 1999, having swerved into the wrong lane, he was rushed back to Norway to face an incredibly lenient sentence of two months in prison, unimaginable if the minister were Norwegian and the venue Oslo. More than 60 criminal investigations against NATO soldiers by the Macedonian police, the tip of an iceberg no doubt, ended this way. So did proceedings in more than 200 traffic accidents involving, or involving almost 20 fatalities. These are the remains of a colonial state of mind. Natives come cheap, their lives are dispensable, the white man's burden must not be exacerbated by excess legalism. Western folks 
should stick together, and above all, should never be exposed to the vagaries of primitive indigenous jurisprudence. In the village of Vitina, in Kosovo, a wiry Hamdi Shabu, in an upturned fur hat and evanescent nylon jacket, waves the photograph of the swollen face of his formerly beautiful daughter, Merita. Her battered body was discovered on Thursday, January the 13th, 2000. <clears throat> no one seems to agree as to where. The 35-year-old weapons squad leader from Fort Bragg, North Carolina, born in Niles, Ohio, was arrested three days later in a show of unprecedented investigative efficiency. He was transferred to, con to a confinement facility, a military euphemism for prison, in Mannheim, Germany, and from there to a prison in Würzburg, near Frankfurt, Germany. It was the said denouement of what started as a love affair. The American contingent of K-4 was welcomed by the Kosovars in scenes of jubilation not seen since the end of World War II. But this exuberance was soon quelled by the liberties some soldiers took with the local girls, for instance, when searching their bodies for weapons. Complaints were lodged and ignored. Another pattern of behavior. American soldiers are exterritorial and above the law. Later, Americans were involved in violent and brutal clashes with local Albanians, including in Vitim. The atmosphere has soured. In Kosovo, the peacekeepers entered a fantastic place, the outcome of a hundred years of solitude. Kosovo is teeming with disgruntled and covenous guerrilla fighters, steely-eyed and ruthless mafiosi, contumacious, small-time delinquents, and noisome, unctuous pimps in chintzy cars. This nebulo-chaotically permissive atmosphere of insidious disintegration and ludic, sinuous sex, soldiers became involved in all manner of invenial skullduggery, drug peddling and abuse, weapons trading, and white prostitution networks. Ask any Macedonian, Kosovo, Greek, Albanian, Serb, or Bulgarian, and they will tell you how deep and institutionalized the involvement of K-4 soldiers is in the smuggling of cigarettes, alcohol, sugar, flour, consumer goods, and women. The surrealistic morass that is the Balkans has digested these people, these soldiers, and enmeshed them in venality and crime. The lack of functioning law enforcement institutions and the gaping void that replaced civil society in Kosovo contributed to the general moral turpitude the unbearable likeness of being has rendered all moral persons remote and niggling. To these soldiers, Kosovo was an elysium of sin, an apogee of lasciviousness and avarice, profligate perdition. Rongi sat impassively throughout the reading of his verdict on July 30th. He offered the grieving family a convoluted apology. He said, I don't know what went wrong that day. Pathological narcissists are characterized by alloplastic defenses. They blame the world, destiny, the universe, or fate, other people, for their behavior, and for its usually deleterious outcomes. Faulty maps were blamed on the demolition of the Chinese embassy in Belgrade. The unfortunate event of the downing of an Iranian airliner was attributed to human error. An American pilot violated his flight instructions killing vacationers in Italy in the process, and was exculpated. Rongi, described as a wholesome American phenomenon by friends, family, and commanders, blamed the day. I don't know what went wrong that day. The day was guilty, not Rongi. He might as well have been discussing a scorched omelette. Devoid of all emotion or compunction, Rongi added stolidly, reading from a crumpled piece of paper, his lines of what evidently was to him nearly a bad script. He mumbled, I apologize from the bottom of my heart to the family. I asked them for my forgiveness. How Freudian. He added, I never did anything wrong before. I know what I did was very wrong. That's why I pleaded guilty. In other words, I'm a good and upright man who can tell right from wrong 
then he assumes responsibility for his wrongful acts. The brutal rape and thrashing to death of a pre-adolescent girl is the exception in an otherwise commendable life and virtuous conduct. But Trongi was unfazed by what he did. To bury Merita's body ensconced in two United Nations flower sacks under the staircase in the basement, Rongi took with him another soldier, a private, who finally turned him in. He told the private, it was easy to get away with something like this in a third world country. Sergeant Christopher Rice, who was on duty the night Rongi murdered the child, added, he knew because he, has done, he had done it before in the desert, in Operation Desert Storm in Iraq. If Rice knew this about Rongi, why didn't he turn him in? If the army knew this about Rogi, why did, why did they send him on, peacekeeping, on a peacekeeping mission involving contact with civilian population? Is it true that peacekeeping operations are the dumping grounds of mercenaries and military misfits, drug addicts and the criminally inclined and insane? That the selection criteria and procedures are less than rigorous is an open secret. Peacekeepers are notoriously culturally insensitive. Undressing publicly in in Kumano, in Macedonia, getting embroiled in inebriated brawls in restaurants and bars, raping and thieving, smuggling and trading, playing with pistols during the famous Struga poetry festival, and all these in tiny Macedonia. This has come to be expected from, from them, but not murder, and perhaps not the rape of a prepubescent girl. So many, under, so many underestimated the pernicious effects of promiscuousness and disdain combined that they were shocked by this event. Many more have turned a blind eye to the conver convergence of the armed presence of Albanian thugs of all political hues and their counterparts in K4. To many soldiers, the citizens of Kosovo, both Albanian and Serb, were subhuman a view shared by the Albanian predators that confiscated their apartments and killed them by the hundreds. This confluence of jaded scorn, this somnolent sadism and condescending malfeasance, the propinquity of criminal and law, made Kosovo the Dantesque Netherland it has become. This has killed Merita. It had the face of wronging, but the number of the beast. And it applies to Iraq and to Afghanistan equally.